20 years. 20 years since Shaun of the Dead was released. That's what we're talking about this week. Um, I can't I can't quite believe that. Where does the time go? Do you know what's mad? Is that um, Simon Pegg actually looks younger now than he did then. Do you think? Yeah. yeah. I, I, well, just sort of doing my standard thing that I do where I kind of sit and go through all the junk kits and watch back all the stuff. He looks... I, I don't know how old he was at the time of filming, but he looks then obviously a bit rough around the edges. So this was kind of similar time that they were doing Spaced, wasn't it? Or they would come to the just, end. Just after, yeah. Yeah, come to the end of Spaced. Um, and kind of, I don't know, just 90... I think in the, the late 90s and the early noughties, like, people just didn't really take care of themselves in the same way, did they? He, he would like, have been 34 at this. He's supposed to be 29. Sean is supposed to be 29, but he was... Because he makes 34. a comment, doesn't he, yeah. about that? And like, so yeah, so, it, um, but like it, you didn't, you didn't sort of, I think in the late nineties, from what I remember in early noughties, health, being health conscious and all that kind of stuff just wasn't a thing, was it? It just, no, it, it was a bit more pints for the lads and, yeah. you know, loaded nuts, zoo magazine, all that turbo lagers, all that type of yeah. thing, wasn't it? It was well, like the film does very much get at that as well. Yeah. It's yeah. like, we'll meet at the pub. Do you know, I, I do love him, right? I, I do love Simon Pegg, but do you know what? He's got that thing now because he's lived in LA for so long where he's got that kind of weird British <laughs> American, like how Emily Blunt does, how they they <laughs> sound British still, but they talk up a little bit think, at the end. Could that, that, bother, that really bothers me. But yeah. do you think it's because we're like, we have some weird sense of ownership over people. So when they go over oh, there, yeah. you're like, be one of us, for God's sake. We're exactly. Doing. You're supposed to be flying the flag out yeah, there, exactly. lads. Like, Why have your yeah. teeth got all nice? He, um, I, I'll tell you another <laughs> thing that's quite... So he's he's recently popped up in the past few years in The Boys um, as Simon Pegg. And he's he's played Huey's dad in... So the character Huey, he plays his dad. Apparently the graphic novel of The Boys the character Huey was actually based on Simon Pegg. And if no you look way. at, yeah, if you look at kind of, um, Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. If you look at images of him, they, they have basically drawn Simon Pegg, but I think, I guess the decision was made that he was a bit too old to, to play this young sort of 20 something character. As you'd imagine, he's in his fifties now. Boy started what, four or five years ago. Um, so he would have still been in his late forties probably when they, when they started filming it. But anyway, he does pop up as Huey's dad. And I, again, it, it did get me thinking, God, man, like he's gone from being like the 20 something loser in Shaun of the Dead to now being the dad character. Yeah. And it's just, I, I, I get it. I get Hands it. Jack. Time is lit. Time moves on. I get it. I, I know that. But when you get start getting older yourself, it's not actually, when it, when it becomes less of a concept, when the thought of time, a passage of time becomes less of a concept and an actual reality, Gets a bit scary. I'm going to get you to spoil this film for us in 60 seconds. Do you okay. think you're you up me. to the challenge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm flying today. I feel All good. Right. I've thought about it. Okay. I'm going to set you 60 seconds now. I'm going to give you a nod every 15 seconds, okay? Cool. That's a three, two, one. Off you go. So, Shaun of the Dead, for me, is about three things. One, finding your identity. Um, two, it's about your relationship with your mates and how they can be both good and bad for you. And then three, I think it's a bit about seconds. taking joy in the little things in life. Um, so Sean is basically a bit of a waste man. His life is drifting. He's surrounded by people that are kind of a bit disappointed in him, including his, his mum and his girlfriend. He's going to lose his girlfriend Very unless second. he finds a way to kind of reclaim his identity. Second thing is his mates. His mate um, is basically, like his best friend is the equivalent of the best thing and the worst thing all at once. And we're basically encouraged to kind of make a judgment on whether his friend is good for him or not. Seconds. And then the final thing is that even though this is a zombie apocalypse, he needs to kind of get to the end and get through it to work out that actually sometimes there's nothing wrong with just taking pleasure in the simple things in life. And it's okay just sometimes sit on the sofa and then go down to the pub. That was pretty spectacular, mate. Yeah, I'm buzzed with that. That was pretty. Little... That was pretty good. Yeah, because I because I, I think really you could like you could probably go all sorts of different directions with that. But the, the reality is, the the Edgar Wright, Nick Frost, and and Simon Pegg together as a group really 
they're just a group of mates. Like I do think that this a lot of this has kind of got a lot of them in it. And so I think this kind of like discussion about like going down. In fact, like I, I saw a thing this week, which was, was what part of the reason why I went down that route with the explainer in that Simon Pegg was saying that um, the girlfriend in this film is Edgar Wright. <laughs> that basically Edgar Wright was like, come on, like, let's do this. Please, can we just like make this thing? And then uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost were them. Basically, they were playing themselves. They were the ones that were like, fuck it, let's just stay, we'll go down to the pub. And Edgar Wright's like, no, come on, let's go to this trendy London party where all these industry types are. And they were like, nah, we'll just go pub. Like, so it's got like a real kind of, um, th- there's a, like a real autobiographical element to it. And they're kind of, a lot of it is about themselves. How, how good is their chemistry, man? Like, oh, so good, isn't it? Egg. Like, and I love, I love that, that, it is sort of one of the things that jumps out at me straight away is that we can all relate to the fact that you've got friends or at times you've been that person that knows you should get off your ass or knows that you should straighten your friend out, but you just go, ah, let's go to the pub. We'll, we'll straight, we'll straighten things out tomorrow. Let's just, we'll nip and grab a bit or we'll play on the PlayStation or we'll, and because you can so totally tell that they're intertwined with each other and they sort of get on so well, it's just so believable, the whole thing. It's so totally believable, even though it's a zombie comedy. You know, they were um, they were once actually flatmates in real life. Yeah, which is, like, you can see it, can't you? Yeah. I, I mean, I think they met through, I think it was Simon Pegg or... Let's have a look. Frost was working as well. Okay, so yeah, he he was mates with Simon Pegg's girlfriend, um, and then they just became like really good pals. And it's this is what we were talking about last week, isn't it? Yeah, just the fact that they've got this like I don't know they've they've kind of been doing it since the nineties. For anybody for anybody that loves Shaun of the Dead that's that's watched this and hasn't seen Spaced, go back and revisit that. I think it's all on E4. I think you can stream it all on there. You should be able to watch loads of it online as well if you like that kind of zany edgar wright style british nerdy humor that is completely present within this you will you'll love space and did you know there's there's an episode of space i think it's i think it's in the first series maybe episode three or episode four where um basically simon Pegg's character he takes too too many drugs basically one night and he's stayed up all night playing Resident Evil the old video game Resident Evil and his reality <laughs> starts to blur with this kind of hallucination that he's having that there are zombies everywhere and there's a section of this one episode of Spaced which actually becomes quite a, a, a convincing and scary like zombie scene um, and it was apparently after they made that scene Edgar Wright had said to Sean, uh, to Simon Pegg, we've got to do a zombie movie at some point. We have to. That was so much fun. And, you know, they're so, like, embedded in, in like, in nerdy sci-fi horror culture in pretty much all of their output. Like, Simon Pegg is, like, this kind of, like, nerd messiah, right, nowadays, isn't he? You know? Well, that's, his, that's his role in Mission Impossible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He's, well, he's kind of like the Mission Impossible's Q, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, um, Edgar Wright said that he had to give up gaming so that he could make Shaun of the Dead. Really? Because it was taking too much of his time and he couldn't, couldn't do it. And so they were making it together and he said that they had a sort of good cop, bad cop thing going and that Edgar Wright had given up the PlayStation and kind of got rid of it from his house because it was stopping him. It was actually a barrier to him creating this thing and then he would be trying to drag Simon Pegg into the uh, almost like the, the writing room or to kind of lock them away so they could start writing and Simon Pegg would be using any excuse that he could to get them out of the room to try and get them to go to the pub or to go and do something else <laughs> which I really really love because I yeah. because I you you know how difficult it is when you have a creative concept or a creative idea, God, this sounds so wanky, but if you've ever worked in production 
you'll know how hard it is to come up with something that's truly original and unique and interesting that you want to create. And that in itself feels like a marathon. Then to commit it to paper is unbelievably hard because it requires such persistence and such self, um, self-motivation and also self-belief as well. You have to really believe that this idea is worth your time to write it down. And then the next thing is to actually go out and get it made. You know, it's not, it, it's such a hard thing that I think actually having someone with you who gives you a kick and goes, come on, we need to do this. And then also having someone there that's a bit zany and a little bit left field and that will insert comedy and silliness and and timing and just wacky ideas into the mix. Is it, they seem like they have wonderful chemistry just in terms of the way that they've gone about creating it. And there's a video online, actually, that I saw this week that they made. Did you see? I don't know if you've seen this, but it's like a Shaun of the Dead time capsule. So oh, they, really? So they have their original whiteboard which got a flip chart on it and it's 10 minutes of them going through the flip chart of the story of Shaun of the Dead with all of the gags that they'd written in the original format and the original um, wording and it's just notes and illustrations and brainstorms and they just flip through it and tell the story of Shaun of the Dead in uh, in 10 minutes and I think they recorded it 20, 20 years ago at the time when they were just about to start filming or just about to start editing maybe. And it's amazing. It's so cool because you can so totally see that they were just these young guys with an idea that they wanted to try and turn into a reality. And it's really beautiful that it, that it exists. It's, it's, it, and I think particularly with what Edgar Wright's gone on to create in terms of the, the films that he's gone on to create, I think, wow, it just started with a couple of guys just wanting to try and make something that, had to convince themselves to stop playing PlayStation so they could make it yeah. a reality. I, I just think that's so it's, lovely. It's, cool. it's quite, a, yeah, it's, it's a bit of an everyman journey. And the thing is, talking about the like the time capsule element to it, this film is 20 years old now. The film itself is kind of a bit of a time capsule of that era of growing up, really? seeing Vernon Kay on T4. Oh my gosh, wasn't you that know? amazing? Coldplay yeah. in like little branded t-shirts or whatever. Yeah all that kind of like it's a knockout style TV <laughs> and stuff on and things like, which it just, I don't know. It, it was mad, isn't it? And I think like what I love about this film, what I really do love is I think it's like, like I sort of said of um, Rye Lane, sort of the film that came out last year. This is another one of those films, which it sounds quite strange to say because it's like a comedy movie and it's a zombie movie. More on that later. But it feels like such an authentic representation of everyday British life of the the characters are so well written and they're so well rounded and the scenarios that are presented are so just believable. Can I chuck one in there for you? Yeah, go on. Yeah. For example, when he nips down to the news agents and doesn't even notice there's a zombie apocalypse because he's just in his own little world. He's like, oh, he's I'm doing his routine. It, it's so spot on, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's like part of zombie lore, right? That's sort of, yeah, they make that point, don't they, in the opening little um, sequence of that cool little tune that's playing in the background when you see people putting away the shopping trolleys. All the people that Ghost Hill by the specials is playing. I think no, I think that's a bit later on in it. Um, I'm not sure what tune it is that this this one is that's playing at the top. But you know, you see all the people sort of scanning the things. You see everyone sat on the bus, and it it's just you know, it's always making that comment that we're sort of sleepwalking through life, if you like, or at least the the system we live in does that to us. It grinds us down. Um, I mean, like like most famously, obviously, like. You know, Giorgio Romero's Dawn of the Dead set in like a shopping centre and everyone's sort of wandering around in there as a as a, as a thing. But th- there is a lot of like, there's a lot of nice little Easter eggs in this film. They do often like nod to um, Giorgio Romero. I was going to say, what's the one that jumps at you? What's your... The, the one that really got me is um, when Nick Frost's... Um, what's, his, what's his name? Ed. Ed. When Ed shouts, when they're going to go and get... Sh- um, Barbara, Sean's mum, and he shouts, "We're coming to get you, Barbara!" 
Because in the original Night of the Living Dead, so the old black and white Night of the Living Dead, there's a scene, and it's it's horrible. If you've never seen that, I think the movie's made in like the late fifties, early sixties, and it's one. It, at the time, it must have been seriously. I actually think it did get banned at the time. I, I don't say that as fact, but I, f- I have a feeling that it did. Um, and you just have this scene where it opens up with two people visiting a graveyard, and almost like in It Follows that we've spoken about on this before. You see just as this scene, as these people are having this dialogue and they're talking, this couple are having this dialogue, you see this man in the background just walking towards them, getting closer and closer and closer. And you don't really know. If you're looking out for him when you know it's going to come, you look from the very beginning and you see how well it's been done. But you only start to notice it as the scene pulls on and he actually starts to get closer. And you obviously know he's a zombie because he's stumbling towards them. And... uh, the man is kind of having love. Oh, look at this guy. Like, look at him coming over kind of as they do in Shaun of the dead. Like, you know, look at him. I wonder what's up with him. And, uh, and then he says to his girlfriend, Barbara, he's coming to get you, Barbara in this weird voice, but that it's got such an enduring legacy. You will hear that line come up in like, it's sampled in like, I think in like songs, you'll often hear characters say it in movies and stuff, but it's an old night of the living dead thing. And I I really liked hearing them um, say that in this, I I wanted to give you one really good one as well. Um, A really brilliant one is that Ed completely in the first scene when Liz breaks up with Sean and they're sat in the pub together, Ed outlines the entire plot of the film to Sean. So his words are, he says that, right, Bloody Mary first thing, bite at the oh, king's head, yeah. cup of the, the little princess, then we stagger back here, bang, back at the bar for shots. And he's basically saying, so the first one, Bloody Mary, is dealing with Mary the zombie in the garden. Then they're going to go to Philip's, Sean's stepdad's house, like the, the a bite at the king's head. Um, then they're going to rescue Liz, the little princess, um, and her friends, and then they're all going to return to the Winchester for the shootout with the zombies at the end, which I, I thought is quite a quite a neat touch as well. Very and I, good. I, I I I did know I had to look this up afterwards because when I was watching it back this time, I was like, "Hang on, that's actually the plot of the film, isn't it?" I, I, saw, I this is the first time I got it. And no I saw way, it. I yeah. love that. And then I googled it. I was like, "Yeah, it is a thing." I I noticed it. Um, I was really quite chuffed to myself for that, actually. Do you know um, what my my two favorite? That's awesome, by the way. My two favorite little nuggets in this that I picked up this time that I'd not picked up on before. You know, he goes to the news agents, and he picks up the he picks up the can of coke, and he looks at the calories on the back, then puts it down and picks up the diet coke. Yeah. Which I love, which I love, but he's at the news agents and, and then he puts the money down and I forgot the name of the shop owner. Um, but it's, it's Western Park Grocers, which I actually know where that is because it's in North London. It's all shot in North London, which is really, really cool. And, um, he says, Oh, I forgot his name. He says, Oh, I'm 15 P short. So I'll, I'll bring it back tomorrow. And then about <laughs> 20 minutes later in the film, the the shop owner has turned into a zombie and is walking towards him, but walking towards with his hand out to collect the oh, other chain. Yeah, yeah I, I see that in the, when they're in the car. And like, I, yeah. And that is absolutely yeah, superb. Yeah. That is and, then, and then I loved, I absolutely loved the scene in the car where it's like Bill Nye is like, I was only ever trying to be like a good role model for you. And like, I was just trying to be a dad for you or whatever. And then they get out what of the car. a touching car. moment, isn't it? And it's lovely. And then he goes to his mum. There is nothing left of that <laughs> man. And then he turns the music off yeah. in the car. Until like, well, yeah. <laughs> that is just, and, and that's one of the things I think that's one of the things that's really magnificently done is that they take these kind of inanimate sort of like these, the, the, these things that have been turned into complete droids. They've got nothing to offer. And the fact that they're walking zombies and not running zombies, right? So it's in that Romero style. Everyone's moving very slowly. They've got no intelligence. They don't really have, they don't really have anything from a sensory point of view. 
Yeah. This is not like smell or, or anything like that. You've got, they're, they're just literally just going based off very much like I can see you, I want to eat you, and that's it. And so when they just give these little flickers of humanity, it, it, it just absolutely kippered me. Like it sent me. Those are the things that I laughed at the most, just these little mo- like And the, the mum, for example, when she drifts off, where they were supposed to be doing the impressions of the zombies, <laughs> she was like, sorry, love, I wasn't listening. <laughs> Just absolutely brilliant, <laughs> really, really good. Which you know, when they say, "Mum, what, what's happening at the house?" Well, some men attacked Philip. Is everyone okay? Well, they were a bit bitey, <laughs> <laughs> a bit bitey. Yeah, you know I, mean? I lo- and also I love that they have these now with the three films. I love that they have the the reference points that you then see in the other two films, and you go back to, and it's really lovely that they kind of like hark back to this film. I mean, there is that there is that real deep dive you can do on on that, isn't there? Like how all of the different characters turning into zombies essentially kind of represent a different facet of British society. It does feel it's an it, to me it is uh, an intrinsically British film. It yeah. completely wears that its heart on its sleeve in that respect, and it's 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 borrowing a lot from like the American zombie genre, um, and we'd never really seen anything like this done in the uk a zombie movie yeah um, particularly not and, in that way no and i think like, and, and it, let's let's do this now because this is an interesting talking point because it's a very funny film it's it's very sharp it's very smart but is it actually a comedy film or is it showing you just two kind of nerd guys how they would deal in the zombie apocalypse because to me it still feels like a pretty kind of scary, scary in the loosest possible sense of the word, but it's still a zombie film, right? But don't you think that's part of the beauty of it? At any point where it gets too scary, you get these lovely releases of comic relief. They just, if at yeah. any point where they feel like, oh, this is going a bit dark, they'll suddenly, they'll suddenly just pull you back with a really funny joke. Other than the very end when it becomes a full zombie film. So, yeah, when they get to the end point and it is just going like it's it's all descending. But even the, 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 the I mean, I don't want to go ahead to it too far now, but the don't stop me now scene yeah. is meant to be the epitome of like in, that. That scene is meant to be the heart of the film, right? In that it is like this violent and scary issue that you're faced with or or set up set piece that you're faced with of we're now trapped in the pub with this huge zombie mafia guy and we're going to whack on the most uplifting song possible at the same time yeah and start beating him over the head with pull cues in time with the music like it, that is it's really really beautifully played because it dances on the tightrope between it being a, a horror a zombie film. it's not a horror film but a zombie film and a comedy film at the same time. And there's enough of the zombie tropes to make you be uncomfortable. Well, the, the funny thing is a big part of it, because the reason for me why it gets so dark towards the end is because it, it's making you realise that this was actually... If you, if you look at it, there's no silliness with the zombies. The zombies still play by all the same rules that yeah. zombies do in zombie movies. They're still out to kill them. They're still out to bite them and get them. What makes it funny is it's Frost and Peg who are, like I say, these two silly men that can't take life seriously at all, still acting that same way in a zombie apocalypse, right? And it's only when the laughter sort of stops for them, when the severity of the situation, when the reality of the situation catches up with them, does it suddenly become, wow, this is actually this is dark now. This is a zombie film. This is scary. And I think there's probably something in there about like Sean growing up finally towards the end, finally kind of losing that childishness, which I do think there's a comment on the fact that, yeah, okay, maybe Sean and Ed push it to the nth degree, but then look at all the people around them. Look how unhappy they all seem to be. Um, Look at look at like their you know their mate that lives with them that's always like sort your fucking life out. That's played by is it Peter Serafinowitz? Yeah, yeah. Um, with his wonderfully kind of deep voice. Yeah, 
who is absolutely jacked in He's this huge. film as well. A normal what a monster. Who yeah. knew? But yeah. they, um, they, uh, uh, the, I think one of the things that is really cool about this, so the, the uh, budget for this film in dollars was $6.1 million. Which is but, minuscule, right? Like tuppence. But yeah. in terms of pounds, because it was shot in the UK, it's four million pounds at the time. That, if you think about a zombie film, that is ridiculous when you have to try because they're not going effects here they they wanted to have people play the zombies so in order to get that feeling of it being a real zombie film they sent out a a, a kind of like message on the internet on message boards extras boards they put an advert i think in the paper and just advertised saying would you like to be in our film as a zombie if you would email this email address and they got 1100 responses. Wow. And, and they said to everyone, listen, we can't pay you. We've got no money at all, but we'll feed you and you'll be in the film. And they had more than a thousand people turn up for those scenes where there's the mass zombies. That's and, sick. And they just did it. And they just like, aud- the, they auditioned everyone. And then the better people they used more prominently, the people who could do it. Um, and the people that were a bit naff, they kind of left towards the back. And then they actually made these huge zombie setups with a thousand people. But the practical effects are amazing as They're well. Really good. They're Loads amazing. Of makeup, like incredible makeup. It's, 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 and that for me is why, like you said, when you get to that end point, you know where they're going over the fences. And he goes, oh, we'll just look over there. And then there's all the zombies outside the Winchester. What? It, fe- <laughs> it feels like a zombie film. You know, it does feel like they've nailed that. Um, and just to come back to your earlier point, I think you're right. I think this is what happens when you sit around and we've all played that game. What would you do to survive a zombie apocalypse? And like your nerdy mates or your mates that are always at the pub would be like, the pub would actually be a really good place to hunker down. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. like literally where people's brain goes. It's got a breville out the back. Yeah, yeah there's a gun there. There's actually a gun there. Yeah. Um, that is, it's, it is a really like natural path to follow, I think. And then, um, yeah, and I just, I love the fact that it sort of plays, the fact that he has his Of Mice and Men moment where he has to put his mum down. Yeah. You know, like it, it really plays with that that comedic tragedy that that makes it, that's what the best films like this do, right? They still make you feel something, even though you're laughing at the same time. Big time. Um, and and also when we get to the end, I think there is there is a kind of tragic element in that his mate doesn't amount to anything. His mate becomes a zombie, becomes locked in the shed, and he sort of is with his partner, but his mate's just still in the shed. He's almost left him behind, hasn't he, in a way? Yeah, and then we'll go out and play PlayStation and just leave him in the shed. And that was kind of... I know that's funny, but it's also... I don't know. I feel like it's making a bit of a point as well, just about yeah. you, about your friends, about your mates. And that, oh, just one more thing. How grim was the bit where um, Dylan Moran's character is getting his intestines ripped out? But I've again, in terms of the practical effects, it's so... And he's such a despicable character in this yeah, as well, he isn't is. he? He is. Grubby, yeah. grubby man. They, grubby the thing man. Is, you feel like it would have been too much to have killed him off. It's very purposeful that he pulls the trigger on Sean and yeah. the gun just isn't loaded. Yeah. But then you're like, okay, you can you can reconcile him getting ripped to pieces yeah, now. Yeah, you can go now. You're yeah. done. Out your pop. Yeah. And like, but like torn to pieces as well. Um, what was your, what was your standout scene? What was your favorite scene? Oh, I don't know. There's a lot I really do. I really do like in this film. Do you know what? I'll tell you what I really like about it. Why re- that I think is brilliant. And I like it about any of these type of films. Is it showing you the build up to the end of the world? And I like how there's all those little hidden bits where it will be like the satellite, which is said to be passing through Earth's atmosphere this evening is, and then someone will change the channel. And there's lots of little bits. It was like there's chemical testing happening at some lab nearby. So so there were all these little things, reasons as to why the zombies might have, you know, why there might be an outbreak 
of of zombies. And um, they call it bollocks at the end, don't they? Yeah. When they say, it. and that the the monkeys that had been tested on it turns out it was absolute. And then yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like they change shadow again. And you see it kind of slow, you know, people coughing on the bus or people collapsing <laughs> or the man like eating the pigeons out in the park and stuff. Like, I, I really like that. I also, I actually particularly like the scene when he's having to manage um, in that, whatever it was, the hour price or wherever it is that he's working, the equivalent type of electrical shop. And uh, he's telling the sort of the young lad that's played by someone who's really famous now again. Um because there's a whole litany of like really Rafe Spall. Future stars. Yeah. yeah. Like a young Rafe Spall in there who's like this typical sort of lad, like texting his mates for trying to get drugs and stuff. And he's telling him no personal calls. And then like Liz, his girlfriend, calls him immediately. You know, it's, I, I like those little touches. But I think, yeah, the lead up to the, uh, the lead up to the zombie apocalypse, I particularly like. How about you? Yeah. I, I really enjoyed when they were doing the impressions of zombies. Yeah. Like I just thought that was just such a wonderful touch. Like you're in the heat of this, but like the crux, the nadir of the, are we going to make it or not? And then you make three or four minutes to just do zombie impressions in a film. I mean, that's genius writing. That's yeah. such wonderful writing. Um, and do you know what? I'm, the script I'm, is tight, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, uh, and it bounces along. Yeah. Penelope Wilton. I adore like, I absolutely adore her who plays his mum. I just think anything that she rocks up in, she's going to be absolutely amazing. Yeah. She's the, like Bill Nye, for me, she is the sort of, you you don't see her turn up in anything crap. You know, you, you see her in it and you're like, yep, this would be good. I feel like in um in Afterlife, like, I'm, I'm really, I know people have a sort of just generally Ricky Gervais can kind of be really on or really off. And I feel like some of the office is one of the greatest things ever created. I think extras is absolutely unbelievable. I wasn't so keen on Derek. Um, Life's too short. I wasn't sure on either, but I feel like afterlife and particularly the scenes with Penelope Wilton at the graveyard to some of the most moving Thing. I mean, it was during COVID as well that I was watching it, but I was a blubbering mess and I just thought her performance was absolutely unbelievable. But she, her in this, she just steals little bits of the film. She'll just have 30 seconds at a time where you're like, that is just class. And the same with Bill Nye as well. I just I think they're both brilliant additions. And when you take the zombie apocalypse kind of tropes and films, they're a perfect little segue. You know, they're the bit in 28 Days Later where he has to go home to to find his mum and dad and they've ended up killing themselves so that they didn't have to face turning into zombies. Yeah. Only we now get to see them turn into zombies. Like what happens if you have to kill your own family so that they don't take over the pub? It's like that scene for me, really, really good. And then the don't stop me now scene as well. Absolutely amazing. Um, So this is really interesting for a film that was 4 million in terms of budget, well, let's just say six million. I think it took close to forty million dollars wow. at the box office. So that it's tough, really, to get any. It would be pound for pound some of the best money that anyone has ever spent on a film, because then you come off the back of it and you have Hot Fuzz, um, and that did uh, eighty million at the box office. Then you have uh, The World's End in 2013, and that did another $46 million at the box office. And then you think, realistically, Edgar Wright, he's got a back catalogue of being a financially lucrative creator and filmmaker. Suddenly, you're then into the realms in 2017 of Baby Driver, which I just thought was absolutely brilliant. I loved Baby Driver. It's such a cool film. And he also had Scott Pilgrim versus the world as well, which was amazing. And then last night in Soho too. Again, much like the zombie scene in space, do you know the pool cue scene in this? So we're talking about there, don't stop me now was again, the spark of the idea for Baby Driver for a lot of the timing action really? with the music. Yeah. Edgar Wright's spoken about that before. That's really it, cool. Yeah. It was just, it, you know, it's not like the full start of it. I'm sure Baby Drivers and I do he had long for for a long time, but it was something he was very keen to play with a lot more. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's just 
the 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 music in Baby Driver, considering that they, I know they had a, they had issues, didn't they? They had like issues in terms of licensing the music and which tracks they could use, which tracks they couldn't. It was just absolutely exquisite. Um, so this is an interesting thing, right? Considering that they that was the money they had to play with. These the ratings are incredible, like what they managed to get. So it's nearly an eight on IMDb, ninety two on Rotten Tomatoes, and eighty seven on Metacritic. And that it's, feels fair. That feels like right. Really on the money. What are you giving it out of five? It's a five out of five for me. I love it. I think it's a brilliant film. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant zombie film. I think it's very funny. It's very endearing. I think the humour, for the most part, has actually aged quite well. Um, well, should we do that? Should we do the, the fun one of war crime? What, what, like, was there anything that didn't? Because I thought, in the most part, I w- went through the film and thought this has actually aged incredibly well. Yeah, there's there's just there's that one moment when Nick Frost uses the N word, and I know he's kind of he's his character's a moron, and he's using it in a sort of ironic, stupid way. I just it's just such a sharp word to hear. Yeah, you know, it's such there's it, it just it really just oh it it kind of it's a bit of a spike, and you know I'm. As you can see, I'm not even a black person. Like, so I, if I'm feeling that, I don't want to project and say how anybody else would be feeling, but one can only imagine. It's just not a pleasant word to hear in any context. It's a knuckle, isn't it? When you, yeah. you you're like, what? Yeah. That, what? Just yeah. so unnecessary. But um, it's, it's not to make an excuse, but again, it's a reminder that still this movie is 20 years old and there are certain conversations that we've had in the past 20 years that hadn't been had at that point, at least in like wider society. Um, and there was a kind of, there was a big movement. Yeah. You look at things like little Britain, you look at the, the humor of the time. A lot of it was based around kind of being quite edgy and yeah. saying things that you knew were naughty, but you, if you used it in a certain context, you could kind of get away with it. Cause you were poking fun at people who do say that word or whatever, you know, and it, it it's just it's to me it's quite emblematic of of that time really yeah you know? i'd agree with that in the a lot of the stuff a lot i'd say more broadly a lot of the stuff that it's poking at turned out to be quite prophetic around that time for the next kind of like 10 years in terms of just people just sleepwalking through their existence and not really sort of able to escape the the cut and thrust of us living a little bit like cattle, you know, and yeah. there is there is a kind of darkness to it that's actually quite sharp. Um, that I would say has aged pretty well. That actually turned out to be quite on the nose. And the comedy, in the most part, it's just it's so layered. The fact that we watched it again twenty years on, and I picked up on something that made me laugh that I'd com- like just had completely passed me by, tells you that it's got enough in there, you know, to to be in that group of films that are in the top tier i think it's quality i thought it was great fun yeah if you actually um if you look online so if you actually just sort of on like x for example and you type like sean of the dead n word there's there's a lot of people saying like i love this film but i really wish they hadn't used that word in it yeah. which is kind of you know that's all you sort of need to need to know isn't it okay. um so um yeah, I I I, th- I think it is brilliant. No, and all the stuff you're sort of saying about friendship and everything is absolutely bang on, mate. It's, I think it's lasted the test of time. And I think, you know, 20 years old now and it is a brilliant time capsule. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, an interesting little look. And I think it's a, a real good reflection on what life was like um, in that moment. And almost... You could say, you know, from that point on, what we have zombie walked into nowadays. Because, like, mobile phones and everything were only in their infancy at that point, but you were already starting to... They were almost sort of foreshadowing their sort of influence and what they were going to do to to us, um, if you like. But great movie. I I, I really enjoyed it. Did you enjoy watching it back? Oh, mate, loved it. Loved it. And... and, um... Just, I, I think it's a, this is this film's one hour thirty nine. I think it's just a reminder that you can you can make something that's really tight and really really fast paced, have a brilliant time, and still make something that's got meaning in it as well. You know, it's so it's so hard to do. It's actually 
it's really, really impressive that there's so much comedy within this that can make you laugh so often and yet at the same time still motor along at such speed. And they do make time, like I said, they do make time for the little setups, like them doing their zombie impressions, which I just think are fantastic. And just that little thing, you know, when they bump into the other group of mates and they're a carbon copy of their group of mates and they sort of walk past each other like football players sort of shaking hands at the beginning of a match. And it's exactly the same group of people. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of, that again is just another little nudge towards the idea. Like everyone thinks they're so different and so unique and everyone is just exactly the same. You know, it was, it was, it was class. And MVP wise, I'm going to go early and I'm going to give it tied equally um, to, to, to Bill Nye uh, as oh. well as uh, Penelope Wilton, because I just think those two have got such a, they don't have a huge amount of screen time. They don't have an amount of like, focus just on them and I just think they're amazing like every time that they come into it who are you going for oh I don't know I mean I do like Peg and Frost I couldn't really I couldn't separate the two of them I also think for like the villainous turn I think Dylan Moran is pretty yeah. spectacular in this like he really keeps the storyline punching along the fact that his kind of scorn and everything is almost what motivates Sean more than actually Sean <laughs> you know <laughs> wanting to motivate himself it's it's really smartly done um and I think he he's just so detestable in it he does it so well yeah um, he does I might give it I might give it to Dylan Moran you know do you know what and he's Dylan Moran is actually one of those actors that he's so flexible yeah he, he can turn up in so many different ways like in in films God, I'd forgotten that he'd been. He's been in some absolute crackers as well. He was in Notting Hill as the thief of the in the bookstore. <laughs> what if I did have a book down my trousers? Which is like <laughs> one of my favorite, like absolute favorite bits of that film. Byob, leave ratings, leave reviews, like, subscribe, all that stuff. Um, follow us on all our social channels. You'll find us basically wherever wherever you can get a social profile. We'll be there. We'll be about. Exactly. Give us a follow, all that stuff. Bye.